They only admit what they can no longer hide. This week we had a very strange video come out on CNBC with Blythe Masters of J.P. Morgan. This is the first time that I've heard J.P. Morgan respond to years of allegations of their manipulation in the silver market. There have been whole campaigns of crash J.P. Morgan buy silver and yet nothing until recently. For those of you that do not know who Blythe Masters is, she's one of the bankers that created the toxic mess known as credit default swaps that is at the root of our housing problem and the current economic crisis in Europe. You see, in the banking world, when you create a mess, you get promoted. She is now the head of global commodities trading at J.P. Morgan. I believe this video marks a new era that is about to break in the physical silver markets, and it does not bode well for those that have created, perpetuated, and profited in the dark. It could be that the fraud has become so large that they can no longer sustain it, or that J.P. Morgan is being set up to be sacrificed so that the system can remain intact. Either way, something very big is happening because they only admit that which they can no longer hide. In the grand scheme of things, J.P. Morgan's involvement in silver is small compared to the shadow banking, rehypothecation, and derivative markets that they control. But unlike those large paper markets, the physical silver market cannot be papered over for very much longer. This video was a well-scripted video whose sole purpose was to take the heat off of J.P. Morgan and make them look like they are good guys, as they are now neck and neck with Goldman Sachs as the most evil bank in the world. A week prior to Blythe's appearance, her boss, Jamie Dimon, made a live appearance on CNBC with Brian Sullivan. Brian Sullivan totally caught him flat-footed when he questioned Jamie Dimon about J.P. Morgan's involvement in the MF Global scandal. And, and before I let you go, I've got to ask you this, obviously, uh, a story out that, that J.P. Morgan attorney saying, listen, MF told us that the transfer was from MF money, not customer money. What can you tell us about the status so, of MF Global yeah, so and I'm, the transfer that Corzine's under a lot of heat for? Yeah. Well, look, you've got to ask them about what they can do, what the rules are and stuff like that. And uh, you know, I think J.P. Morgan acted appropriately the whole time. There's actually testimony. So anyone else, they can go read it and go through the detail of the bank accounts. The bank, you know, they took down a lot of bank loans right before they went bankrupt. And uh, uh, so I, I don't know all the details, but more to come. Can you tell us where, do you know where John Corzine is, by the way? Because there's a couple people that would like to talk to him. No. And the whole point of Jamie Dimon even being on CNBC was basically to, to put out a bunch of goodwill about how many vets that they're hiring at their banks and that we owe it to the veterans to, you know, give back and, you know, help them out with their homes. Um, and then Brian Sullivan takes him out and asks him this question, and obviously he was very upset about it. So one week later, we have this interview that is totally scripted, totally an inside set. Um, and I could just see Jamie Dimon coming to CNBC and saying, hey, I'm trying to get out here and look like a good guy, and your reporter corners me. I want something back. So I think that was the genesis of this interview that we're going to see a little bit of, of Blythe coming out and talking about how they're giving $5 million to the University of Denver to help them uh, with their cause. Again, they're giving away money like that's going to make things better when in fact that they're the root of the problem, that there's no amount of money that they can give away to get them out of the mess that they're in. The first part I want to comment on is the staged look of where they are. Here they are announcing a center for commodities, and it's in this, you know, on the back wall it says Center of Commodities and J.P. Morgan, and the, the desks and the computer are totally set up, like no one would actually sit there. It's, it's a total stage. Um, but even her physical appearance, you can tell that this is... A woman who does not like being in front of the camera. She comes off very dowdy. She's wearing this awful turtleneck, and her hair is in her face so that they, you know, they can't. She can't even see the camera. You know, this is done purposely. She doesn't want to be there, and she's somebody who would rather be behind the scenes, which is why there's so few interviews of her. Besides the English accent, she has been known to be a uh, very domineering woman, telling her team to sack up and suck it up and, you know, that type of mentality. So this public persona does not match the Blythe behind the scenes. And J.P. Morgan has been investing heavily in commodities for some time, definitely under your leadership. We've seen, as Sue mentioned, a tripling of your revenues in 2011, topping $2.8 billion. Tremendous growth. Many see it as part of your vision, your strategy, for the reason that that has happened. Is that really sustainable? When J.P. Morgan closed the proprietary trading desk on August 31, 2010, it was reported that J.P. Morgan would lose $1.4 billion worth of profit a year when they closed that desk down. So when they were speculating in the markets, they made $1.4 billion. Now that they're not speculating in the markets, they make $2.8 billion. Give me a break. So here we get to the real meat of the interview. 
Well, we've been investing in the commodities business, and it's important to realize that our commodities business uh, is not about uh, betting on commodity prices. It's about assisting clients in executing, managing their risks. So she said the first important thing that we needed to understand was that JP Morgan is not betting on the markets. It's code for basically saying we're not going against the Volcker rule and that we're not actors inside of this. This is a way for her to try to say, I'm not the bad guy, I'm just helping the bad guys. And this would make sense as the Volcker rule, I believe, was a cover for them to change the dynamic of the silver manipulation and move the risk to the unlimited balance sheet of the, of the Federal Reserve and the Treasury. I don't believe she would come on national TV with an obviously scripted plan to, to expose herself to future allegations if this was not true. And a lot of concern has been placed, though, about J.P. Morgan's, particularly its positions in the metal space. Mm -hmm. And looking at your positions in silver, we talked earlier about the volatility in the silver market. Can you talk about J.P. Morgan's positions and price volatility, and how are they related? Yeah, that's a great question. And you're right that there's been a tremendous amount of uh, speculation, uh, particularly in the blogosphere, about uh, this topic. And I think the, uh, the challenge is uh, that that speculation represents a misunderstanding as to the nature uh, of our business. As I mentioned earlier, our business is a client-driven uh, business uh, where we execute on behalf of clients to achieve their financial and risk management objectives. Uh, the challenge is that uh, commentators don't see all of that activity simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So just to give you a simple example, uh, we store significant amounts of commodities, for example, silver, yeah. uh, on behalf of customers. We operate vaults in New York City, in Singapore, and in London. Uh, and often when uh, customers have that metal stored in our facilities, they hedge it on a forward basis through JP Morgan, uh, who in turn hedges itself in the commodity markets. If you see only the hedges mm -hmm. and our activity in the futures market, but you aren't aware of the underlying client position that we're hedging, then it would suggest inaccurately that we're running a large directional position. Yes. In fact, that's not the case at all. We have offsetting positions. We have no stake in whether prices rise or decline. Rather, we're running a flat or a relatively match. So First, how is it possible for J.P. Morgan to have 25 to 35 percent of a market and there not be huge investigations and charges into manipulation simply on the size of their position? Then, if J.P. Morgan is simply acting on the client's behalf, how is it possible that they found all these clients that are buying physical silver, storing it with them, and then hedging their physical silver by shorting paper silver in a coordinated attack on special days to destroy the value of the underlying asset that they are investing in? And why is there hundreds of times more paper contracts than there are physical ounces in their vaults? In fact, J.P. Morgan only has 10 million ounces of silver in their vaults, and only a million and a half of that is in the register category to play with. Yet their position in the future market is far heavier relative to the physical metal that they have. Their story doesn't jive on so many levels because they're lying through their teeth. But behind every good lie, there is truth mixed in, and that is what I think is the most interesting development. We know intrinsically that anyone buying physical silver wants it because they see what is coming and want exposure to real tangible assets. I think it's ridiculous that they claim that JP Morgan's clients are buying silver, storing silver, and then hedging their metal in the future markets by going short. Why even buy the silver at all? Buying physical silver is the hedge to a fiat world gone crazy. That is unless the clients are the Federal Reserve and the Treasury. I believe that when JP Morgan shut down their proprietary trading desk, their role changed from the controller of the commodities to frontmen for the Fed and the Treasury. There's far too much power at stake to let there be a challenge to the dollar supremacy. Just like we go to war for oil to defend the petrodollar, the criminal elite will continue to manipulate the physical silver market to hold the line. By having the unlimited balance sheet of the Federal Reserve and the Treasury, JP Morgan can continue to trash the silver market without having to worry about their own balance sheets as they are only acting as brokers and not playing with their own money. How else would you explain $2.8 billion in commodities tradings if they're not gambling with their own money? It's not because what is commonly out there is that J.P. Morgan is manipulating the metals market and from what you're outlining that is not possible because of the different sides of the business that you're in part of. That's right. It's not part of our business model. Uh, it would be wrong and we don't do it. You're right, Blythe. It would be wrong but so is driving the getaway car in a bank robbery. If the Fed and the Treasury is your client and you're just reaping fat client profits, it does not excuse the crime. But when your bosses are the ones that determine what is legal and illegal, 
you can act with a certain amount of arrogance. But when the fraud is exposed and people's entire life savings are destroyed because of financial crimes you participated in, no government in the world can stand up to a disillusioned, pissed off mass of people looking for justice, at which point we will see capital punishment for capital abuse. And the excuse of that you were just following orders doesn't fly. The higher the price physical silver goes, the more pressure will be brought to bear in the unsustainable system. When this happens, the billions of profits that they're rolling in now will be nothing next to the trillions lost and the anger that will swell when all of humanity finally deals with the consequences of allowing a few insiders to manipulate our physical world for their own private profit. I would once again warn that anybody who's a part of this racket come out now and confess. It'll be too late when this all goes down. People will not want to hear excuses at that point. There is no hope inside their paper casino as they have unlimited funds and can see all of your cards including your stops, which is why these raids are so effective as they can plot out as many stops that they can blow through to cause the waterfall sell orders to come in and wipe out all long positions. There is no hope with the regulators as a ton of very fine commentators have wasted enough time trying to get them to do their job when the reality is they are doing their job just fine. They're keeping up the legitimate facade of this criminal organization. There's an old saying, you cannot cheat an honest man. And that is why I only deal in physical metal, as I can never be forced to sell my metal. Those that gamble in the casino are seeking to dance with the devil and not get burned. They are just as much a part of the problem as Blythe and company. If people like the MF Global customers walked away from their casino, they would have no power over the market, as it would be irrelevant to the physical market. This is what the silver bullet and the silver shield is all about empowering us and deleveraging and delegitimatizing the current financial tyranny. The only way to make this end is strike at the Achilles heel of the Anglo-American Empire and use the silver bullet and the silver shield to keep stacking every time they attack the paper markets. Things that cannot go on forever won't and this will be no different. So don't use this manipulation as a reason why not to participate in the silver market. It is the greatest generational gift of all time because when this fraud is exposed and we have real price discovery in a totally open global market at the same time that there is a worldwide currency collapse each ounce of silver will represent a lottery winning of real purchasing power